Hello and welcome to the Smarter Food Supply Chain webinar series. I'm Mike Allen and I serve AIM as their Member Engagement Manager. AIM North America is an alliance enabling the cooperation, development, standardization of AIDC technologies. From barcodes to RFID to IoT, AIM North America is your advocate. Any organization with an interest in data collection is a beneficiary of these efforts. Membership provides an opportunity to influence the direction of the industry, develop policies and standards, access market reports, and engage new partners. Before we get started, there are a few housekeeping items I would like to go over. On this slide, you see our antitrust policy. It's the policy of AIM Inc. to conduct its operations in strict compliance with the antitrust laws. No AIM activity shall create even the appearance of a violation of the letter or spirit of the antitrust laws. We also have our collab collaboration and work product policy, and that states that committee meetings and presentations are held for the primary purpose of advancements in our industry, which necessarily involves development of work product intended solely for the public domain. AIMS developed this policy for the protection of its members who engage in this important collaborative effort. You also notice that you are muted throughout the presentation. If you have any questions for Carol, just send those via the chat to AIM member services. We will answer as many questions as possible at the end of the presentation. I'm here today with Carol Kokendurfer, Principal of Linkages. Carol led the first WTO case on product labeling over 20 years ago, where product transparency, traceability, and trade were first raised. She has served on four U.S. government advisory committees and regular, regularly participates in U.S. embassy training programs for new personnel regarding regulatory trade barriers, blocking U.S. and global supply chains. Carol will be discussing a new era of data-driven, tech-enabled, and traceable food. Carol, take it away. Thank you, Mike. Thank you, AIM, for this opportunity and for those joining today. Thank you for your questions, and I look forward to hearing them a little bit later. Let's jump in. When we think about food traceability, frankly, nothing about this is new or revolutionary. Uh, many of us have been dealing with supply chain management issues between customers and supply chains or suppliers, dealing with business issues, contract issues, traceability issues arising with certifications related to exports abroad, or even validation of labeling of sustainable products, organic products, biotech engineer products, and within the decade, likely CBD products too. But when we talk about food safety and food safety traceability, what we've been talking about for the last 20 years has been one up, one down product tracing or product traceback. Today, what we're gonna talk about is end to end, farm to fork, seed to spoon traceability that's being envisioned by the new era of food safety at FDA. Now, as many of you know, that again, this is still Renee, is not new. We've been piloting end-to-end -end traceability for some time. But the application varies across the commodity ag area, where we look at GE and non-GE soy and train cargoes, or the you know, barcoded fresh produce, whether it's apples, oranges, or lettuce, or to how we apply it to processed food products, whether it's an energy bar or a, a frozen pizza. To date, this has been managed primarily through the creation of a paper trail, PDFs, exchange between customers and suppliers. But what we're talking about and what's being envisioned is a one-time data sharing into an ecosystem of customers and suppliers where this information is shared digitally. And what FDA action is being proposed and being talked about is a, as a potential game changer not only because of the use of a powerful new technologies, and I mean plural technologies, but also the enforcement power of the US government to compel action, which frankly is a powerful combo. So what is it we're talking about with this new era of smarter food safety? What is compelling FDA's action? Well, first and foremost, it's FSMA, the Food Safety Modernization Act, which many of you know. FSMA has been in place for almost 10 years, since, not 2000, or since 2012, and it's nearly fully implemented. But yet we have a rising incidence of food safety, an unveiling and uncovering of food safety instances that's happening in the marketplace that we haven't recognized before. And disappointingly, still one in six Americans uh, are suffering from food safety incidents and risk in the marketplace. So something needs to be happened. We need to uptick our efforts. 
But we're also seeing, and FDA is seeing as well, significant changes in the marketplace that we're operating. In less than 10 years since this new law was written, we're seeing new, air, new approaches to food safety delivery in particular. Many of you know about food, ta food taxis, Uber, Grubhub, food drones, bicycle messengers. We're also picking up and collecting and storing our, our groceries in lockers outside of the grocery stores and clicking and connecting, collecting them on, this, on the curbside. These are all new and different and were never envisioned by FISMA. And FDA is asking is, is this last mile delivery new and different and creating food safety challenges? It was never envisioned by FISMA and FISMA is only 10 years old. Do we need to go back and look at these and accommodate for these new marketplace changes? We're also taking into account consumer expectations. FDA knows that consumers are far more interested and have smartphones and quickly can access information about their products and the food that they are buying with the QR code and barcodes, and they are doing so on their phones. But there's also an expectation back to these food deliveries that the bicycle messenger, that the food taxi, that all the food that's delivered to their doorstep is safe. So customer ex consumer expectations, not only about the attributes about the products, but also the safety of the products is compelling FDA action. But clearly the most driving force is technology itself. The new developments in the marketplace, whether it's something as technical as whole genome sequencing or a QR code on a smartphone, but most notably blockchain, artificial intelligence, uh, sensors, internet of things, the cloud, these technology developments are driving FDA's new thinking around smarter food safety in a way that's creating new opportunities. But don't think that this is just applying for food alone. Yes, we have a new era of smarter food safety on the horizon, but FDA is looking at technology more broadly in terms of its broader public health mission. In fact, it has a technology modernization action plan in circulation both in the agency and broadly about how it intends to use technology, both in pharmaceuticals, medical devices, as well as with food. And the new era of food safety falls within this. In fact, if you read this document, and I'd be happy to share it with anybody, uh, it's only a seven page document and eminently readable and, and fairly short, maybe seven or eight pages. It really gets into the details about how the agency intends to use artificial intelligence specifically to accelerate the review of pharmaceutical molecules and to, to develop new drugs. And so drugs that once used to take 10, 15 years for research and development can be isolated through artificial intelligence and their attributes identified and quickly the, the development time for new drugs can be shortened from 10 years to possibly three years, if not shorter. And in this current epidemic of COVID, that's exactly what's happening. FDA is using these new technologies, AI specifically, to zero in on the attributes of pharmaceutical, mole or pharmaceutical molecules to potentially identify a new vaccine that may help us with COVID. And that's how the agency is looking broadly to apply these new te technologies, not just for food alone. But let's zero in specifically on food and FSMA. Within FISMA, there is section 204. It instructs, Congress is instructing FDA to establish traceability requirements for high risk foods. Congress also provided for industry pilots to identify and look closely at traceability and study, as well as a study of industry practices to inform FDA's rulemaking. But the interesting thing about FISMA section 204 is it's very limited, it's very narrow. Congress is very precise about the scope of the FDA's rulemaking and it tells it so, and we'll talk about that in a moment. But here Congress has required FDA to act by 2014, and we're sitting here at 2019, and nearly 90% of the act has been developed or written and even implemented, but Section 204 remains unimplemented. So several NGOs sued FDA and it forced and compelled action. And sure enough, FDA agreed that by September of 2020, less than five, six months away, it will issue a proposed rule 
and then it will finalize that rule on traceability by November 2022. Now it's important here to note that Congress has a view of what FDA needs to do, and it's very explicit, and it lays, for, lays that out in Section 204. But this study of industry practices is going to have a huge influence in FDA's thinking. And it's going to create a, a fork in the road, if you will, two divergent approaches to traceability. And that's where the new era of smarter food safety emerges. As I mentioned, FSMA Section 204 focuses really on high-risk foods. You know, where do we see a history of outbreaks? Where is there a likely of contamination to take care, take, uh, occur? It says FDA cannot look at certain types of agri-food operations. It can't look at commodity ag. It can't look at seafood and fishing vessels. It can't look at certain types of operations. Moreover, it must remain technology neutral. So it's a very narrow scope of activity. Uh, it very statutorily limited. But then Congress provides funding for a study by the Institute of Food Technology. And here a group of industry as well as academic experts came together through IFT and made recommendations to FDA on traceability that said, you know something FDA, you should look at all foods because once a food is contaminated, it creates a risk for everybody. And that risk of contamination applies to all food once the contamination takes place. So you need to look at all food. Moreover, you should be looking at precise data requirements dig and digital platforms and standards because once a food has been created a food safety incidence, you need to quickly recall it. And we have to be speaking the same language. We gotta be looking at the same types of information. We need to be using the same type of standards to be sharing that information. And we should have common forms of digital platforms interoperable talking to each other so we can do a quick recall. And yes, the food companies need to be doing product recalls as well. And at the end of the day, while the big companies can manage a lot of this, the FDA and the states really need to work at the state and local level to help medium and smaller companies manage these quick recalls. Because frankly, that's where the food safety expertise is needed the most and the digital knowledge as well. So the IFT study is quite a bit more expansive. It actually leaps from the pages of FSMA to a more broader activity, whereas FSMA is much more narrow. And this is where we see two traceability paths leading from the agency. We see a formal rulemaking where FDA is going to act under FSMA with a very narrow scope focused on high-risk foods it's not going to talk about technology. It's not going to talk about data. It's going to be quickly enforceable by FSMA, but it's going to remain silent on most of the issues that are frankly critical to those of us that are moving products in the supply chains. And they're going to refer to this more formal rulemaking as simply traceability. But from the pages of FSMA and this IFT study, we're going to see a more complementary effort that still leverages the broad FSMA authority, not the narrow authority of Section 204 alone. And it's probably going to address a far broader expanse of foods beyond just high-risk foods. Because as I said earlier, once a food is contaminated, it's contaminated and creates a risk regardless of what type of food it is. And it's going to leverage the market me mechanisms and the broad authority of FSMA to move forward. Now, what do I mean by market mechanisms? Well, FDA may not have the specific authority of 204 to address all foods, but it can work with suppliers and customers to instigate what's called retail regulation or to put into check expectations that if you're going to do what is prudent in public health, you better prepare to do these kind of activities. So they're going to leverage their broad FSMA authority with this new era of food safety. And they're going to go beyond the limited narrow scope of, the, of, of Congress, and they're likely to encourage the use of digital hyperledgers, blockchain, AI, sensors. They're going to likely lay out standards, GS1 standards perhaps that could be used, or identify key data elements that will be required as we look to a more digital, tech-enabled new era of smarter food safety. And the one thing that you need to keep 
uh, aware of is when you see the word enhanced traceability, we're talking a more tech-enabled, FISMA-enabled, data-driven enhanced traceability under the new era versus a simple traceability scheme for a more narrow category of foods under FDA's more formal rulemaking. So recognize that what we have ahead of us is not one pass, but two, two paths for a traceability actions by the agency. Now, many of you know our new FDA Deputy Commissioner of Food Policy and Response, Frank Giannis. It is very clear that he is the driving visionary of this new era of smarter food safety. And you'll see in front of you some statements that he has made about this new era that's yet to come. Unfortunately, because of the COVID incidents, we have yet to see the details of what the, the blueprint of this new era will look like. They were supposed to be issued in March. We hope to see them yet in April. But frankly, as we look towards the issue of the formal rulemaking in September, I would not be surprised if we saw both issued in September. But he is the driving visionary behind this new era of food safety, and many of you know he came from Walmart, where he worked with IBM and the Food Trust to leverage these technologies in, ident in two test pilots. One in tracing the uh, production uh, and recall of mangoes, I believe from Hawaii, where he took it from days and narrowed the recall down to mere seconds, and similar with pork bellies from China, where again, he tracked and traced pork bellies from days down to mere seconds. He clearly was infinitely impressed not only by the use of digital hyperledgers and blockchain technology, but also how blockchain and these ledgers can be uh, uh, put in contact with also sensors to create the internet of things within warehouses, artificial intelligence to identify where legitimate food safety incidences repeatedly occur, and how these technologies can be played with each other in a complementary way to create a new era of smarter food safety that would reduce the one in six incidences to perhaps even further, uh, further less. But they, he also brought along several other market players or marketing mechanisms, suppliers and customers of Walmart to the table to see this larger picture. Companies like Albertsons, Wegmans, Wakefern, Kroger, Nestle, Dole, Unilever. So they have all been participating in, the, in this pilot and they have begun to see the same thing and you have already begun to see a movement in the marketplace to this era of smarter food safety, even as we await FDA's blueprint. So let's talk about what this means for AIM and its members. I've not spent a lot of time about talking about the technology and there's a lot to be said about each of these technologies they're very exciting, each in their own way. Maybe that's another webinar for another day. But let's talk about specifically in this new era and what the opportunities are for AIM. And I think the question that many of the listeners need to have is asking yourself, what are the critical requirements for enabling unique product identification and RFID traceability of food? What is it that you do? What is it your company is going to do that help enable this new era? Now, clearly we're talking here about pharma, but as I mentioned, or food, but as I mentioned earlier, this is also going to be across the entire agency in pharma and medical devices. How well does FDA in the States, FDA in the States know and understand your business? Remember, these are food safety professionals. These are public health professionals. These are not supply chain folks. These are not uh, RFID experts, IT experts. You need to tell them, you need to show them, you need to meet with them and partner with them. Do they understand where critical breaks in the supply chain traceability can take place because there's incomplete sharing of information, that the unique product ID is not so unique? You know, you know your business, do they? You need to share that information and I think you will be surprised at how welcome they are for that information. Whether it's simply written comments, as I know AIM made, to FDA last fall, or as it thinks forward as the agency finalizes the detail of the plants, uh, of its blueprint as we speak. So there's some urgency in sharing this information with the agency. Have you done so? I think you also need to think about your own customers. 
I would wager a bet that many of the contacts that you're talking to, frankly, are in the supply chain management area, if not the IT. But yet, this new era of food safety, uh, or smarter food safety, that's going to compel company action, if not from the US government itself, then, then in the marketplace, is not gonna happen in the supply chain management or IT departments. It's gonna happen in the food safety departments, maybe even in the environmental or product R&D areas as we think about CBD products. Do you know these folks? Have you been talking to them? These folks are down the hall and frankly often speak a totally different language and these different silos within companies aren't talking to each other. You have the opportunity to bridge those silos and create a larger vision within your companies about traceability and the efficiencies that can be had both in supply chain management, omni-channel marketing, food safety, environment, and other aspects of product traceability. Which gets me to my next point. This is, the new era creates an enhanced opportunity for customer collaboration. Because yes, as I mentioned earlier, this rulemaking as well as the new era initiative itself will compel a response. We're already seeing the, the large companies do it even without FDA finalizing its blueprint. So if you're gonna have to do, and this, this act is gonna create a cost, this compliance is gonna create a cost, why don't you build value into these tracing systems? If you've got to do it for uh, regulatory compliance, as we start thinking about sustainability and quality products and, and biotech and organic, that's where the product margins are greater. And even with omni-channel uh, marketing or consumer transparency, that's where the value is. You'll see in the lower, lower right-hand corner of the slide an extruder where various strings are strung into one rope. Here's where I would encourage you to bring those various vertical silos I talked about earlier and into one horizontal vision of tracing to find the efficiencies in one, in one approach to product tracing in a given company. You're in a position of knowledge to help your customer to see these and to bridge this horizontal view into one rope like you see down in the lower right-hand corner. Which gets me to my last point. Drive the internal and external collaboration because this is where innovation occurs. Elevate the understanding and appreciation of data management, scanning systems, and new technologies. Frankly, let's be honest. How many of us really understand the internet, how it actually works? And then you wanna understand the, I, or the clouds and artificial intelligence and blockchain? Frankly, the people in the, uh, listening today probably know more of it than their customers. And sharing that understanding, both within the, your customers, as well as in the broader community, will help them. This enhanced knowledge and understanding will be appreciated. This is, new technology is difficult for all of us, even as we struggle to understand Zoom and WebEx and all these new technologies. Taking a moment to stand aside with your customers and explain it to them, both internally within their own companies, but how they operate with their own customers and how they need better data management, how their scanning systems need to be thorough to get a good scan, how unique product identification is critical in all of this, much less how it interplays with these new technologies. Drive this internal collaboration, both inside these companies and around them, and you'll see innovation and growth. And with that, I'd like to take a moment to talk about linkages. Linkages is a global trade, industry, and public affairs consultancy. Linkages recognizes the seamless supply chains, the highly connected consumers, and the innovation that comes through collaboration. Linkages specializes in food and consumer product in the retail sectors, leveraging 25 years of experience and contacts, both in the United States and in the globally. I invite you to connect with me on LinkedIn because I believe you, as I do, that trust, transparency, and traceability depend upon linkages. And with that, I'll happily take any questions. Thank you, Carol, so much for your insights today. We really appreciate it.
uh, we do have several questions uh, from the audience and audience members, if you have a question, you can still have time to uh, chat that over to us. Uh, one of the questions being that you did say earlier that you have over, you know, 20 years experience, you know, in the industry. And uh, it was just basically wondering what's the biggest technological advancement you've seen in the past 20 years, in your opinion? So much is happening. Um, I think the evolution of what we are calling the digital twin, where we used to trade products, you know, put a, uh, a spaghetti sauce in a, in a box and ship it down the neighborhood to the neighborhood grocery store. We're now shipping it abroad and it has a physical identity, i.e. it is a product that needs to be assured of the product safety but it also has a digital identity. And, now, and, and that means the ones and the zeros that move that product from the manufacturer literally across the ocean in the caseloads and in filling cargo vessels in a way that just is mind boggling. And the movement of those physical products, as well as the sharing of information about the attributes of that products, not only between customers and suppliers, but also with consumers on a scale that we've never seen before is a level of technological accomplishment that is, is significant. So I think it's the, uh, the rise of what we're calling the digital twin, the sharing of information and globalization coming together. Great, thank you. And you touched on it a little bit, but what impact uh, does COVID-19 have on the era of smarter food safety? We all can look back at certain moments in our lives or in history when there was an inflection point and things changed dramatically. And I think we can all agree that what's happening right now uh, as COVID unfolds in front of us is just one of those times. But it's also a convergence of technology. It's a convergence of, uh, and what we're gonna see is an acceleration in our lives like we've never seen before. Um, just the fact that I now have six, if not 10 different types of Zoom, WebEx, BlueJeans, uh, Skype uh, interactions. It's far greater today than it was two weeks ago. And this technological innovation is gonna be significant and it comes down to the sharing of data. And we are seeing this in the food and consumer product and retail space even more so. Just think of all these restaurants that have gone out of business and they are quickly converting their back shelves into grocery stores. They're no longer restaurants, but they're grocery stores. A month ago, they were out of business. And this leveraging these new technologies to change our lives and to change our approaches requires a nimbleness that has been forced upon us by COVID. Okay, great. And what is the biggest impediment to implementing electronic traceability? Probably the most difficult aspect about traceability is also the most boring, and that's data management. It's got to be complete, it's got to be accurate, and frankly, it needs, it requires a good scan. If any of information is complete, is incomplete, if the scan is not complete, you can't trace the information back to the source. And it means setting up a data management system that frankly, many small and medium businesses uh, don't do for themselves. They do what's required by the retailer. But in a moment of crisis, when one of their products is recalled, if they don't have complete information, it's going to be very, very difficult for them to help um, FDA or their consumers get out of the situation. And an issue as mundane as uh, data management, making sure the data is accurate and complete and that the scan is clear is really probably, it's the most mundane, but it has to be managed in a strategic and thoughtful way every day. Thank you for that. And we had a participant ask uh, about the future of mobile traceability tech and if that is going to be the key to implementing a lot of these uh, food safety initiatives. Absolutely. Because again, the expectation is going to be as much from the consumer as it is uh, in the back warehouses of, of food companies. 
So uh, mobile tech is going to be critical and central to so much of this. You'll be able to uh, have a smartphone in your back pocket with an app that can quickly scan and read and move is the, is the definition of agility. Okay, great. And what would you say to a brand concerned about the cost of traceability? What I've tried to heighten today is a recognition that yes, with government regulations, there is a cost. And as this new era of food safety goes forward, whether as a formal rulemaking or as an agency initiative, both under the authority of FISMA, you're gonna, it's gonna be a cost. However, if that tracing system that you put in for food safety also allows you to trace for organic or for biotech or for the sustainable practices and you get a bump up of two or three percent in your profit margins, all of a sudden that traceability has a value. It's no longer just a cost alone. And this is where I challenge uh, the listeners to yes, let's help FDA take us to a new level of food safety for our broader public health. And yes, incur that cost, but transform that cost into a greater value so that you actually benefit from it yourself in looking at new attributes of food products that consumers want to know about and are willing to pay more for and to do so through product traceability. All right. Well, that concludes our question and answer session. Uh, thank you, Carol, so much for your time today and your insights. We really appreciate it. Thank you. And I look forward to hearing from you. Please contact me on LinkedIn or through AIM North America. And thank you, audience, for your active participation today. Uh, wish everyone a great rest of your day and uh, stay healthy and happy.